Ron. Where are you? Where is A.A. Ron right now? You done messed up, A.A. Ron! A.A. Ron is right here. And I haven't done anything this time. I haven't done anything. Nothing I'm about to report to you is my fault. <laughs> um, okay. So Danny Masterson's legal team has filed a motion to have the charges against him dismissed. And what's remarkable is that they are blaming, not blaming, they're using as the basis for their motion an interview that Tony Ortega and Chris Shelton did with the jury foreman shortly after uh, the trial uh, ended in a mistrial. And Tony Ortega talks about this on his blog today. Uh, this is on tonyortega.substack.com. Uh, it's going to be my, I'm going to try to keep this particular stream uh, PG or at least PG 13 uh, to the best that I can. That's why I chopped off the first line of this headline. It's absolutely ridiculous what YouTube will suppress videos for, especially considering that the mainstream media can talk about all these things uh, with, with no problem. And, and uh, uh, nobody says that's not family friendly, but you, all of a sudden uh, independent creators do it on YouTube and it's uh it's a horrible, horrible thing. So anyway, uh, so check this out. Tony Ortega, and by the way, this is, all, this is all occurring in advance of a hearing that is scheduled in this case on January 10th. Um, you, uh, the, the, the first trial against Danny Masterson, who for those just catching up here, Danny Masterson is a Scientologist, you know, actor from that 70s show. Uh, he was on the show with Ashton Kutcher, also called The Ranch on Netflix, which he got booted from. And he was charged and tried for doing some horrible things to a number of women. And that trial ended in a mistrial, a deadlocked jury. So I want to make sure that no, everyone understands he was not acquitted. He was not acquitted. But when the jury ends in a mistrial, the prosecution has to decide whether to try again or whether to dismiss the charges. Those are really the only two options. Try again or dismiss the charges. Um, th this hearing on January 10th is when we hope to find out whether the prosecution has decided to prosecute in advance of this hearing, of course, Danny Masterson's team is going to ask for the charges to be dismissed. That's their job. Um, it just happens to be um, interesting that what they're seizing on is this interview that was done with the jury foreman. Now, I can tell you, there are a lot of people, people associated with this case who did not want this interview to occur and asked that this interview not occur just for this reason. Um, but it did occur anyway. And let's... Uh, Let's see what Tony has to say about this. So ahead of Tuesday's hearing in L.A., Masterson's legal team has filed a motion to, to dismiss. Oh, we're not going to say that word. Oh, my God. Um, dismiss uh, charges based largely on what was said in an interview conducted with the jury foreman from the first trial, which ended in a hung jury on November 30th. That interview was conducted by Chris Shelton and Tony Ortega and was posted um, uh, uh, you know, to Tony's blog and Chris Shelton's YouTube channel. Uh, at the trial... The jury was not able to come to unanimous, unanimous verdicts. That's fine. We already covered that. It's a hung jury. I'm not just going to read every word of this thing here. So, okay. They arranged an interview. Dun, dun, dun. Okay. So, Tony, Tony says, We told the foreman that we were generally impressed that the jury had carefully considered the evidence in the case and had taken their task seriously, even if they could not come to an agreement and a unanimous verdict. Now Masterson's attorneys are trying to convince uh, Judge Almeida, she was the judge who oversaw the trial, that the jurors' observations and our comments to him suggest that a retrial would not change matters, and so charges should be dismissed. By the way, this says that the retrial is currently scheduled for March 27th. These dates are really just placeholders. Um, there is not uh, – uh, you, you would think that for a trial to be scheduled – there would already have been a decision to to actually retry the case, but no such decision has been made. These dates are just placeholders. Um, Tony's quoting from the motion that was filed here. It says, immediately following the pronouncement of a hung jury, the deliberating jurors, as well as the alternate, spoke freely and candidly in the jury room with all trial counsel. The clear sentiment of the jurors, virtually to a person, was that there were significant evidentiary and credibility problems with the government's case. And while there was disagreement as to the ultimate vote, uh, on one thing the jurors all appeared to agree, no reasonable jury was ever going to come to a unanimous finding of guilt on any count. You know, this is just editorialization and opinion from the defendant's attorneys. So I don't, uh, that doesn't honestly matter. Uh, okay. But here they talk about, 
uh, the interview. Shortly thereafter, on December 8th, the jury foreperson gave a lengthy recorded interview to one of the daily trial commentators, Tony Ortega. In that interview, the foreperson provided specific details as to how the jurors approached and undertook the deliberative process and what evidence was important to their conclusions. The insight provided by that foreperson during this interview confirms what the post-trial discussions of the jurors with all counsel had indicated. This was a conscientious, thoughtful, and deliberate jury, which took its job and its individual opinions with all seriousness, and its vote totals resulted from such seriousness rather than from any bullying or browbeating from one or two of its members. And as a review of the four persons interview reflects, the way in which these deliberations were conducted supports exactly what the vote tally reflects. The likelihood of conviction on any charges at retrial is low. Okay, so uh, Cohen, uh, this is Tony reporting. By the way, quickly, I, I see a super chat, so let me just make sure I don't miss it here, guys. Hey, Aaron, by the way, I asked Michaela if she knew she could run around a poll for $2,500. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, Elizabeth. Thank you for doing that. If you get a response from her, let me know. Oops, sorry, didn't mean to do that. Hold on. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Back to what I was saying. Cohen later singles out our praise for the jurors' descriptions of how the jury had deliberated. Even Mr. Ortega, <laughs> even Mr. Ortega had to commend the jury for how conscientiously it approached its task. Early in the interview, Mr. Ortega told the foreperson, it's already obvious to me that you paid very close attention to the details and we're back there talking specifically about the details of what you heard on the witness stand. I'm very impressed that you knew all this. Mr. Ortega later elaborated, well, it sounds like the methods you were using were really, really good. It sounds like everyone got a chance to say what they wanted to say, that all the evidence was very thorough. I think the thing people worry about in juries is you end up with one or two people that are really unreasonable and are not participating. But it sounds like you've kind of got people on both sides and that everyone was cooperating and participating. Similarly, after hearing the foreperson describe the jury's process, Mr. Ortega's co-interview, Chris Shelton, stated, I'm not at all judging you guys for the decision-making process you engaged in. It sounds like you were, you were passionate, you were in there, you were interested, you were doing the work that is expected of you, and I couldn't ask for anything more. OK, so Cohen concludes that because this jury took its job seriously and could not convict Masterson, another trial would be a waste of time. What Cohen does not cite were multiple assertions by the jury foreman that the prosecutor, Deputy DA Reinhold Mueller, could have done a better job presenting the material and that if he had, it might have made a difference. And in a retrial, that's exactly what the prosecution would take under consideration. Hmm. Cohen then runs through each of the cases, citing the issues that the jury foreman had. I don't think there's any point uh, in this video to just uh, rehash all of this. Um, basically, in the interview that uh, Tony did with the, for the jury foreman, the, jur the, the foreman was giving examples of some inconsistencies that came up over the many years uh, in various reports, in various police interviews. And, and the foreman actually broke it down by Jane Doe 1, Jane Doe 2, and Jane Doe 3. He was calling out the things that were sticking in the heads of some of the jury members who were going to vote to acquit. And, and it does seem weird to me that the jury foreman basically said, however, if the DA had done a better job presenting certain evidence a certain way, these things wouldn't have been a problem. Um, I do find something a little strange about that statement. Like the evidence either shows what it shows or it doesn't. Um, does it really matter how the DA presents it? Perhaps it does. I'm just, I'm just, you know, saying things off the top of my head. What do I, what do I know guys? I just grew up in a cult. Um, oh, that was it. That's the end of this thing. Oh, hold on. Oh, my bad. That's not the end of it. Okay. It is Cohen's job, of course, to make the argument that a retrial would be useless. Yeah, I mean, it, it is. That's his job. And so it's not surprising that he would cite the jury foreman as an authority on how well a retrial would turn out. We're interested in seeing what Mueller's response is and will be in the courtroom on Tuesday to hear it firsthand. Well, see, this is interesting because, you know, it is, it, I don't know, if you put yourself in, let me stop sharing this if I can figure out how real quick. Stop sharing. If you put yourself in the shoes of the DA or the deputy DA, 
I think the deputy DA makes his case for why he wants to do a retrial and the, and the elected DA is the one who actually makes the decision. If you put yourself in his shoes um, as to what he might be thinking, what might factor into his decision about whether to retry, it certainly would very much depend on what exactly was going through the jurors' minds. And for people who were concerned that perhaps an interview with this guy might sway the DA's decision on whether to retry, the more I think about it, the more I'm not sure that that concern really holds water. Uh, because that would imply that less information instead of more would somehow be better for the DA uh, in, in making a decision about whether to retry when really you would want as much information as possible, good or bad. Uh, there's no virtue in retrying a case if the, the facts, uh, if the facts indicate that it would be a waste of time. And I'm not saying that it is. I would love to see this case retried. But if that was the concern, if the concern was that, oh boy, if the jury foreman gets up there and really, you know, craps on all of the Jane Doe's, that's going to affect the DA's decision. Perhaps it would affect the DA's decision, but it would be warranted. And that's why I think um, an interview with the foreman would not have been a mistake, even if certain people didn't want it to occur. The more information, the better. The more the DA understands what was going through those jurors' minds, the better. The more he understands anything he might have done, uh, well, done wrong would be the wrong way to put it. A anything he understands about how he could improve his process, the better. And I'm not sure which way this is going to go. I've spoken to people very close to this case who have a high confidence level that it will be retried. And I've spoken to people very close to this case who have a high confidence level. It will not be retried. What do I know, guys? I'm just a guy with a small YouTube channel who grew up in a cult. I don't know any better. I, my opinions on this subject are not more qualified than anyone else uh, involved in this thing. And, um, but, but I sure am biased, and I, and, I don't, and I don't hesitate to call out my bias. People who understand how Scientology works, people who are in Scientology, in the C organization during the time that this stuff occurred, people who know um, the actors, uh, in both meanings of the word, involved in this entire thing, know that Danny Masterson did this because they know they are familiar enough with the Scientology side of the equation to know that the way Scientology dealt with all of this shows they know Danny did this. And I, I understand people go, oh, innocent until proven guilty. Innocent until proven guilty is the standard for the government, for the law. Innocent until proven guilty is not some universal truth. If you saw somebody commit a crime, you know they're guilty, regardless of whether a jury who wasn't there, uh, regardless of what they say. Do you, I mean, I think <laughs> you guys know what I'm saying. Like, So many people jump into the comments like, oh, he's innocent unless he's proven guilty. That's not true. If you know someone did something, they are guilty. And to you, can, to you, they may not be guilty in the eyes of the law, and that's okay. These things are not the same. Um, what the heck was my point? <laughs> oh, my bias. My bias is that I know Danny did these things, and that's why I want to see it retried, and that's why I want to see him found guilty, and yet I am at the same time willing to I, – I acknowledge there is a difference between knowing somebody did it and, and being able to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt to a, to a jury. They're two different things, and I recognize that. And I think the DA has an uphill uh, battle, and I hope they take on that battle anyway. Let me see. I see a, see a thing here. I know I'm way off topic, but I think I know how anyone can legally sue Scientology for the crap those crazies do. All right, Elizabeth, shoot me an email. Let me know. I mean, it's fine. <laughs> Thanks for the super chat. So that's my bias on it. Um, but you know what would be refreshing and honest is if, is if everybody who covers this trial uh, actually acknowledged uh, their bias on it instead of covering it and pretending that you're unbiased uh, and pretending that people who are biased aren't quite up to your level and you're the only one who's unbiased, like it gets a little silly after a while, I must say. So, you know, that's me. That's how I'm talking about it. Those are my thoughts on it. We're going to find out what, what is it already the seventh? 
Is it the sixth? It's the sixth. We're going to find out in four days, fingers crossed, hopefully, whether this case is going to be retried. And uh, whatever we hear, I'll give you guys an update on it. Thanks for tuning in. I have one more live stream I'm going to do today. Warning, it is not safe for work. Uh, it is about the abuse, uh, the types of abuse that I've been exposing on my channel the last couple of days, the abuse that occurs in Scientology. That one will be, again, I will unmonetize that one so that I can really speak my mind. So join me soon. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that notification bell, if you will. And uh, that's it, guys. Talk to you soon. Okay, if you want to see my rock and roll songs, click right on this guitar. And if you want to see a, a different one of my videos, uh, oh, then you could click right inside here. If you have subscribed or not, subscribe right here. Bye!